Okay, it's Thursday. Uh, lockdown part two begins. Uh, the election is still not decided, although it's uh, trending in favor in the presidential race towards Biden, it looks like. Uh, although, you know, nothing is certain yet, and there's probably a long road of contention, legal contention ahead. Uh, so, needless to say, the world is getting interesting. Uh, we're going to keep it right there at that same level of interest with properties of the profit maximization paradigm. So just a quick recap, what we've done so far is we constructed a mathematical model of the theory of a firm. The firm faces prices of an output good and um, prices of or costs of an input, uh, set of inputs, in this case capital and labor. And the uh, firm uses those uh, inputs to create the output according to some fixed function f, which we call the production function. The goal of this firm is to maximize profit, um, and we originally looked at a firm that was minimizing costs to meet a, a threshold. That was a cost-minimizing firm. Now we're thinking about a profit-maximizing firm, and profit is defined as revenue minus costs. So the value of the output, the amount of output times its price, minus the uh, total cost, which is the amount of each input times its relative costs. Um, not relative cost, it's costs times it's in the amount higher. So uh, from this problem, we constructed three auxiliary functions, right, which describe the solution, the factor demands, which is how much of each input, capital and labor, do I demand, um, the pr supply function of the firm, which is plugging that factor demand, the optimal amount of capital labor, back into the production technology to see how much does the firm produce, and then finally, the uh, profit function, which is just the profit applied to these optimal quantities, the optimal supply and the optimal hiring of capital and labor. So how much money does the firm make um, when it optimizes its profit, when it's maximizing profit? Um, each of these functions, the factor demand, the uh, supply function, and the profit function are functions that take uh, a price vector, uh, a price of the output and a cost vector, and they return something, right? So the inputs of all of those functions, the, the domain on which those functions act, are the same. It's a price for the output and a cost for each input. Um, so uh, let's talk about some properties of these functions. Uh, the first is uh, that the factor demand is homogeneous to degree zero. Um, this says that if I change both the price of the output and the price or costs of the inputs at the same rate, right? I multiply them both by some positive quantity, um, then I won't change the resulting demand for inputs. I will produce at exactly the same level. My profit will go up and down, scaled by that same amount, right? So if I double the price of the output and I double the price of the inputs, my relative trade-off between how much I should consume of the inputs to create outputs actually remains the same. Um, and we could show that, we can prove it, um, I think I'm going to make this a homework question, actually. Uh, we can talk about it in the homework. I think that's probably the best way to go about that. Um, it's a straightforward application of uh, a theorem that says that if you have a function uh, and you find a maximum of that function, then when you take an increasing transformation of your function, the maximum is still a maximum, right? And this is exactly the same as when we said if prices and... Uh, if, if prices and... Um, all change at the same rate and the income changes in the uh, utility maximization case, then the budget set doesn't change, so the resulting function is the same. Um, the, the demands is the same. This is an analog to that, and it's proved in much the same way. Um, there's really nothing magical going on. Uh, the idea is just, it doesn't matter what unit of currency we're denoting these things in, right? Profit is a measure relative to some currency. If we multiply the, all the, the valuations by a thousand or a hundred, you know, say instead of using um, dollars, we use cents. We would, you know, multiply all the prices by a hundred. That's not going to suddenly change the way that a firm maximizes its profit. It's going to maximize profit in cents instead of dollar. Everything's going to have two extra zeros on it. But other than that, there's going to be no difference in what you actually choose. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. Um, here are, is a is a properties of the pro profit function. Um, and this is sort of the key in fitting, in understanding this, in understanding how to analyze the output of our model, right? So our model makes these predictions. This is really what the predictions are. This is corresponding to, uh, we've now had two sets sl set slides with theorems that look very similar to this, one about the expenditure minimization uh, of, a, of a consumer and one about cost minimization, which of course was exactly expenditure minimization of a firm where it gives you a, a bunch of, a laundry list of, of, uh, of properties of those 
optimized functions. And here we're gonna see that it's, it's pretty much the same. Um, the profit function in this case has four key qualities that, that are important for us um, to make analysis. And the first is it's homogeneous to degree one. Now, what's that mean? It means if I multiply um, both the profit and the cost, the, the price and the costs by some fixed scale, um, the resulting profit just scales up and down by that same fixed scale. In other words, if I move from using dollars to using cents, which means I multiply my prices and my costs by 100, um, then my profit gets multiplied by 100. It just means that profit is denominated in the same currency, the same metric as the prices of the output and the cost of the inputs, right? It's just saying that there's some common um, accounting. And as I move the accounting up or down, I move the accounting both for the prices, the, the input of the, pro the profit function, also the output of the profit function, the total of the profit. Uh, that's really straightforward, right? Once you plug in, once you realize that X star is homogeneous to degree uh, zero, and you write down what the profit function is, revenue minus costs, you see that if you put a T in there, the X star doesn't change, but then there's a T floating around on both terms, uh, the, both the revenue and the, and the cost, and so it just pulls out front and you get that profit is homogeneous of degree one. Um, the next thing is that, uh, that profit is convex. So uh, we had the expenditure minimization function uh, was concave. And we said that that was result related to this idea that you could keep doing what you were doing and you would have a linear change in costs and instead you could actually optimize a little bit more, right? If one good got relatively cheaper to another one, um, you could optimize. And if you optimized, like by rearranging how much of the two goods that you choose, you could lower your cost compared to that linear translation if you hadn't done anything. Um, and that said that, you know, the, the expenditure function was concave, right? And we, we, we actually drew some pictures with pseudo expenditure functions. I encourage you to go back and look at those. We here have exactly the dual, not exactly the dual, but close to the dual uh, of that, right? The opposite, that it's con convex in its arguments. And remember, we're, we're doing a maximization problem, so not a minimization problem, so that makes sense, right? And the idea, the logic or intuition is the same, that if the relative prices or... Um, uh, cost, the, the price of the inputs or output change, um, you could optimize, but you don't have to. And if you don't op if you don't change, then the, the profit is just going to move linearly, right? If you're just doing the same thing you're doing before, but the price has changed in a linear way, then the profit's going to change according to that same scale. Of course, you could actually uh, change the, the ratio of inputs, right? If labor suddenly gets really cheap compared to capital, you know, say there's two worlds, one in which labor is really cheap and capital is really expensive, one in which capital is really cheap and labor is really expensive. Well, when they're very asymmetric, I might just hire labor in one, one world and just hire capital in the other world, right? And I never have to deal with the expensive component. However, when I have to, uh, when I mix between these, I have half world, you know, half the cost of one, half the cost of the other, both lap, ca capital and labor are reasonably uh, expensive, right? Neither one of them is particularly cheap. Uh, neither one of them is very expensive, but they're both in the middle. And if they're both in the middle, I have to hire either capital or labor, and so my profit is lower than it was at either extreme, right? And that's convexity. That says that my profit in the middle is lower than it is at the extremes. I would prefer extreme prices um, because I can move away from the expensive inputs and towards the uh, cheap inputs. When the prices are smoothed out, I, I can't avoid the expensive ones, right? Because they're all reasonably expensive. Um, let's actually prove this um, using uh, a nice little heuristic argument called revealed preference. Um, and this is actually how we proved the same thing about the expenditure function. Um, so I'll go kind of quick with it, um, but I encourage you if you don't pick it up to watch it a few times um, and try to understand the mechanics of each step, uh, you know, pause the video and, and understand each line. And if you still don't understand it, then maybe we could talk about it uh, in the seminar or you could bring up, a, you know, in office hours or something. So say that we have three bundles, right? Um, so first of all, what is what is convexity, right? Always write down what you're trying to prove. So pi, um, if uh, so, pi is convex uh, means that you know it's some it's some kind of shape that looks like that, right? Which means that um, the alpha combination is lower than the alpha combination of the outputs is higher than the output of the alpha combinations. In other words. Um, alpha, uh, alpha pi of p c plus one minus alpha pi of p prime c prime um, is 
greater than, that's this point here, right? If this is p prime, and this is p, you know, this is p and this is p prime, um, and then this is the alpha combination, mixing after the outputs here and here, you know, these are the outputs, mixing um, after is, uh, is better you get up to this point than if you had mixed first and then taken the profit, right? Which is, so it's bigger than pi of alpha p c plus one minus alpha p prime c prime. That's the definition of convexity. So this is the definition of convexity. And we want to prove that this is true, right? We want to tr prove that this relationship holds. That's the definition of convexity. And so to show that pi is convex, we want to show that pi satisfies this equation for any values of p and c. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose two values. We're going to choose uh, p and c, and we're going to denote the factor demand of p and c by x star uh, p, C, right? And that's just a, a demand for capital and a demand for labor. When I say demand, I mean, uh, you know, factor demand for capital and a factor demand for labor. Um, and we're also going to have, uh, we're also going to have um, uh, P prime, C prime. That's a different price and a different cost, right? So we have our, our cost vector and price vector in blue. That's one. And we have our cost and our price vector in, um, in maroon. And that's a different one. And that's going to give rise to x star, uh, I'm going to call this thing x prime. Um, what I want to do actually, uh, so I'm going to call this thing just x star, and I'll, I'll call this guy, um, so x star of p prime, c prime, is, uh, I'm going to call this thing x star prime. Um, so the notation, I'm just trying to cut down on the times I have to write this p and c. We also have to talk about the intermediate point between them, right? So we're going to have um, uh, alpha p uh, c plus one minus alpha p prime c prime, right? That's just a different vector where I'm pointwise, uh, you know, uh, taking the convex combination of the price of the output and the cost vector of the inputs. And I'm going to call this thing just uh, p c alpha. So this is just a p c the p prime. Yeah, well, I'll actually do it on the. Um, I'll do p alpha c alpha, and p alpha and c alpha are just the alpha combinations of p and p prime and c and c and c prime, right? And that gives rise to a vector x star of p prime uh, p alpha c alpha, and I'm going to call that thing x star alpha, and I'll use I'll try to remember the color scheme too. Now what we're going to do is we're going to build what's called a revealed preference argument. And this is a key idea in economics, and it's really what drives this idea of convexity, um, is the idea that you could optimize, but you don't have to. So what do we know? Well, the first thing that we know is that the price, the, the profit of um, PC, well, we can write this out. What is this equal to? It's P times F of um, X star minus C times X star. Right, c dot x star. That's the definition of the profit function. The first term is the revenue. The second term is the cost. Profit is revenue minus cost. And at the optimum, when we're picking x star, when we're picking x star to optimize profit, the definition of profit is plugging back in that optimum. Right. This is pi star. Right. Uh, what? Now this is greater than p f. I'm going to leave a blank minus c dot something, and I'm going to put in um, x star alpha and x star alpha. Right. Now, why is this? I could have chosen x star alpha when I'm the firm and I face prices P and cost C. I could choose x star alpha, but I don't have to choose x star alpha. Right? Instead, I could choose, uh, I, I mean, that's one of the available options to me. Right? And the fact that I didn't, the fact that x star was optimal and x star alpha was some other choice of inputs means that the profit associated with x star must be greater than or equal to the profit associated with x star alpha. Right? So this is called revealed preference. Revealed preference. Uh, I mean, in, in utility theory, it's called revealed preference. Here, it's sort of like revealed profitability or something. The fact that you chose x star 
means that it gives you a higher profit than X star alpha because X star alpha was an available thing to do, right? You didn't have to, you know, that no one said you can't choose X star alpha. So the fact that X star was profit maximizing means that it must be giving you a higher profit than X star alpha. Okay. Now we have another, um, we have another equation of a similar sense, which is X pi star of P prime C prime is equal to P prime F of X star prime minus C prime times X star prime. That's just the definition, plugging back in the definition of profit. Profit function for P prime and C prime is just P prime times the conditional factor demand inside the production function when you have that P prime and C prime, and then the cost when you have P prime and C prime, and we call that thing X star prime. And just for exactly the same logic, we know that this is bigger than P F minus C, uh, where we put in, um, X star alpha, right? When I was facing, I'm the firm, when, when I'm facing the price P prime and the cost vector C prime, I chose X star prime. That means that whatever profit I got when I got X star prime is bigger than the profit I would have gotten um, uh, when I chose, uh, if I had chosen X star alpha. And, I, and X star alpha would have given me a profit when I was facing prices P prime and C prime, according to that line here, right? Because that's if I had chosen X star alpha when I was facing P prime and, P and uh, C prime, I would have plugged it into this uh, profit function and that's what the profit I would have gotten. So the optimal profit, the profit when I choose optimally, which is when I choose X star prime, must be greater than the, op the profit when I choose sub anything else, which um, in this case happens to be X star alpha. Now I'm going to just add these two equations together in a fancy cool way, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add alpha of the top line uh, and 1 minus alpha of the bottom line. So I have alpha and then I'm going to have uh, P F of X star minus C dot X star um, and then plus 1 minus alpha and then what's on the bottom, which is uh, P prime F of X star prime minus C prime uh, dot X star prime. Okay, so that's just the top line. That's just the top line. And we know that that's going to be greater than or equal to. And now I'm going to do the same thing with the things less than it. So I start out with an alpha. And then I have a P, uh, P f of x uh, x alpha x star alpha minus x star alpha uh, plus a 1 minus alpha and, and then it's a p prime f minus c prime and this is a x star alpha, x star alpha. Now everybody should sort of see where this is going at this point, right? Um, notice that here I have alpha p times an f x star alpha. And on the other side I have a 1 minus alpha p prime f of x star alpha, right? But these terms are the same. And these terms are the same, right? Um, so what I can do is I can gather the alpha times p and the 1 minus alpha times p prime, and I can pull it out front. So I can write this as alpha p plus 1 minus alpha p prime f of x star alpha. And that's this term and this term, and then I can pull out this term and this term in the same fashion, and I get uh, minus alpha c plus 1 minus alpha c uh, prime, times uh, x star alpha, dot x star alpha. Okay, and now everyone should see exactly where we're going. Um, this is alpha, what's in the blue, that's just the profit associated with P and C. Alpha P, that's uh, alpha, the profit with P and C, plus uh, one minus alpha, and what's in, in the burgundy is just um, pi of P prime, C prime. 
Well, what's at the bottom? This is just P alpha, and this was P uh, one minus alpha, right? So, uh, sorry, C alpha. And so what I get is that that's greater than the profit of P alpha C alpha, right? Or the profit of the mixtures, right? This is just the mixture, and this is the optimal thing to do when you're mixing. So this is equal to P of um, alpha P, 1 minus alpha P, alpha C plus 1 minus alpha C. Um, so, so this last step is really where the magic is happening, and there is something sort of magical about it. So I encourage you to watch this a couple times if you, if you didn't feel comfortable with it, um, and get a, get a good handle for how that argument works and why it works. Um, but, you know, it's not, there's nothing super, super difficult. It's just this conceptual idea that, you know, you could have chosen X alpha, instead you chose X star. You could have chosen X alpha, instead you chose X prime on the different costs. And then they happen to aggregate in a way that gives you exactly what you want. It's a really beautiful argument. Um, so moving on, we also have that uh, the profit function is not increasing in C, which means if you make costs of inputs higher, you can't get more profit, and it's not decreasing in P. If you make the price of the uh, input, uh, if you make the price of the output higher, you can't make less profit. Um, and those are both very intuitive. In fact, there's a proof on the next slides. I'm gonna go, I'll just leave them up here. You can take a look and just, uh, um, you can pause it if you're interested, but I think you should be able to convince yourself that that's true, uh, both intuitively and mathematically. Uh, and then finally, and this is akin to many other things that we've done before, that Q star, the supply function of the firm, is the derivative of the profit function with respect to P. And that thing's called Hotelling's Lemma. It follows from something called the Envelope Theorem, which I decided not to really go into detail in, in this course, but it came up before when we showed that uh, the Hicksian demand was the, was the derivative of the expenditure function, or the conditional factor demand was the, expenditure, was the derivative of the cost function. Here we have that uh, Q star is the derivative of the, of the profit function. Uh, and, and it's the same argument, the same reason why uh, it comes from something called the, the envelope theorem. So here's a proof of three, uh, the, the, the non-increasingness in uh, C and the non-decreasingness in P. Uh, and so you can take a look, pause it here if you want, and, uh, and make sure that you understand the, the logic of the argument, but I'm not going to belabor it or waste time in the video. It's very straightforward. Um, so what about this thing? Um, you know, before we had the, the we had... Hicksian demand is downward sloping. We call that the law of compensated demand. And here we get something called the law of supply, which is that um, supply, the supply function is increasing as a function of price. It's upward sloping. So this, the law of supply does hold. Remember that the law of demand didn't hold. The law of compensated demand held. But for while raising demand, we couldn't show that it was downward sloping because of the, the, the possibility of GIF and goods. And here we have that the... the um, the supply function is downward sloping. And that follows from the same logic as we had with the, the uh, compensated demand. The idea is that, um, I don't know why I'm calling this Y star, that should be a Q. The derivative of Q with respect to P, the, that's the slope of the supply function, is the second derivative of the profit function with respect to P, following from this fourth line, which says that Q is the derivative of pi. So if I take the second derivative of pi, I get the first derivative of q. And we know that uh, from, well, I'll stay here. We know also from two that pi was convex, which means that its second derivative is positive. And if it has a second der positive second derivative, then the first derivative of the supply function is positive, which means it's upward sloping. Now, one last, um, one last quick point I want to make, and I actually am going to talk about this in the seminar, so... Um, We'll go through, I'll go through it a little bit faster here because I want to make a, a, lo a longer, broader point about it, um, is that we have a duality here, but it's not the same duality as we had in, uh, it's not as tight of a duality as we had in the consumer case. So remember, in the consumer case, we really had the expenditure minimization and, and uh, utility maximization were very much the same um, thing. I mean, they, they had exactly the same kind of... Um, logic to them, and you could solve one by solving the other with the appropriate parameters. Here, we get like it goes in one direction, but not the other. So the theorem is that if f is a production function, and it has a supply function and a, con and a associated conditional factor demand, and a factor demand, 
then that factor demand solves the cost minimization problem given that the production has to be at least the size of the supply, right? So given that if a firm is, is um, maximizing its profit and it decides to maximize its profit by uh, selling or, or um, manufacturing Q star units of output, producing Q star units of output, then the cheapest way to produce Q star units of output is the factor demand itself, right? Is what the firm was doing. Um, and this proof of that is on this slide. I'm not going to, I encourage you to look at it, uh, but I'm not going to go through it line by line. Um, it's only two lines. Um, the idea is that if there was a cheaper way to produce the same output, then that cheaper way would have maximized profit because it would have produced the same output. So you would get the same side, same amount of revenue, but it would have produced less costs because it was cheaper. And so it must be a higher profit because you're getting the same revenue and less costs. Um, and that's actually exactly what this line, so I did go through it line by line. Um, I just didn't do it in notation, um, but that is very much, that's exactly what's going on. It's saying that as you, um, it's saying that uh, the, uh, I don't know how much I want to talk about this. I think I want to save some things for the seminar. So I think I'm going to talk about this uh, in detail uh, in the seminar because I think that's a important, there's an important characterization here. Um, but I'll leave you with this thought, and this is a, the thought to think about and bring to the seminar, is um, this is uh, not, it doesn't go the other way, right? It says a cost minimization problem is not a profit maximization problem because it's not the solution to a profit maximization problem because it could be that you're choosing the wrong level of output, right? And that's the reason, right? So when you, when, you ch when you profit maximize, you get to choose the level of output and how you construct that level of output. Remember way back when I said you could choose the output and the inputs. So you get to choose the isoquant to be on and then you get to choose the cheapest way to be on that isoquant. When you're cost minimizing, you only get to choose how to uh, choose the inputs, right? And you have no control over the output. So it's a more restrictive problem. And so you could be at a point where you're not profit maximizing. And the reason is that the profit maximization problem is not a constrained problem. You can choose any level you want, and that's what makes a difference, and that's what breaks the duality uh, that we had in the uh, in the consumer case, where they were both constrained maximization problems. Um, so, yeah, I think I think that's all I want to say. I will go over that again. Um, so, if this last bit seems a bit mysterious, I, I'm going to talk about this uh, in in uh, in some detail in the. Um, in the in the seminar because I think it's an important idea about how we can think about um, profit maximization as a two-stage process where first you choose a level of output and then you choose the cheapest way to achieve it and we can use our predefined notion of a cost function as coming from that minimization process uh, and so we can restructure the profit maximization as a two-stage process one of which is just cost minimization and one is which is choosing the optimal output so I will uh, I will leave you with that um, sort of mysterious introduction and maybe that whets your appetite to show up for the, uh, for the seminar.